Thank you. So again, I'm Britt Berner, and this is Demystifying Medicaid. It's going to be a two-part topic. Uh, Thursday will be the second part by Robin Berner Dalio at 2 o'clock on the 16th. And we're going to be working to explain certain misconceptions that come up a lot uh, when we discuss Medicaid with clients and other individuals. So I want to start by saying that the first thing that's important to realize is that when I'm talking about Medicaid in this context today, I'm talking about the Medicaid long-term care program. So I'm not talking about Medicaid for those who don't have any other health insurance and who are say 30 years old and unable to work and don't have health insurance. I'm talking about long-term care Medicaid for those who are, who are over 65 years old or have a disability. So this is going to be, in most cases, for people that we call dual eligibles. Dual meaning Medicare and Medicaid. So the first misconception that comes up all the time is that people think if they move to Medicaid for long-term care purposes, that they will lose their Medicare coverage. And that is not the case. Medicaid is the payer of last resort. Medicaid will cover services that are not covered by Medicare or a Medicare supplement or the Part D prescription coverage. So again, it's very important to remember that's the type of Medicaid that we are talking about today. So it's important to understand that when we talk about financial eligibility for Medicaid, we're talking about everything being split up into an asset, otherwise known as a resource, or a stream of income. So we have to think of all of the assets you have fall into those categories, resource or income. So for a single person, uh, one person applying for home care or nursing home Medicaid, the resources, the limit is $15,750. This goes up a little bit every year and that is the 2020 number. That means that the balance of all of your accounts, of all of your assets that are countable, has to be less than 15,750 in order for you to become eligible and remain eligible for Medicaid services. If it is two persons applying, so if we have a sp two spouses who are both applying for Medicaid, they can have $23,100 between the two of them. But in many cases, even if it is a married couple, one spouse is applying, has to be under the $15,750 level, and their spouse can have additional funds, which we're gonna talk about separately. So what is a resource? So there are certain things that count as a resource. Your checking and savings account balances, a brokerage account, if you have a second home or a vacation home, if you have um, life insurance, a whole life or universal life policy that has a cash surrender value, that cash value, not the death benefit, but the cash value will count as a resource. Um, 529 plans of which you are a custodian. This is very commonly confused by people because that money has been thought of as being earmarked for the education of usually a grandchild or a child or some other person. But if you are the custodian of that account, you have control of that account and therefore it is your asset for Medicaid eligibility purposes. Non-qualified annuities. This means annuities that you bought with after-tax money. So if you had $150,000 and you went to the bank and you bought an annuity with that money, as opposed to money that you put away for your retirement, which was pre-tax, that non-qualified annuity balance is going to be an asset for Medicaid eligibility. If you have a joint account with another person, that is going to be looked at for your Medicaid eligibility. Also timeshares. These are assets for eligibility purposes. What are not assets and will not be held against you as an asset for eligibility is one, a qualified retirement plan. So for example, if you put away money pre-tax in a 401k, a 403b, a 457, a traditional IRA, a SEP IRA, all of these are examples of tax-deferred retirement plans. Those are not considered an asset unless 
uh, I'm sorry, they are not considered an asset because they are considered a stream of income. We're going to discuss that in a moment. Also, your primary residence is not considered an asset for eligibility purposes if it is worth the equity value is less than $893,000. So if you have a home with, an, with a value of a million dollars, but you have a $300,000 mortgage, then the equity value of that home is $700,000 and it will not be seen as an asset for Medicaid eligibility. However, I do wanna caution you that even in those circumstances, we usually require or request that people move that residence out of their name into a trust because we do not want that asset in their name at death because if it is in their sole name at death and it has to pass through probate, then it is going to be seen as an asset that can have a lien put on it for Medicaid after the fact. So for eligibility purposes, it might be exempt, but that does not mean that it is protected in the sense that Medicaid can't put a lien on it after your death. So it's very important that you look at the primary residence and what to do with it, even if it is under that $893,000 value. The next thing we're going to discuss is income eligibility. If you are looking to apply for home care Medicaid, then your income is looked at as well in that you are allowed to have $875 worth of income plus a $20 disregard for being age blind or disabled, which means Medicaid says that when your income comes in every month, you can have $895. Now, what kind of income are we talking about? We're talking about all income received, earned, or otherwise. So it's very important to look at everything that's coming in. This could be, and these are just examples, there are more items, Social Security, a VA pension, any other pension from working from a union, a required minimum distribution or other distribution from a retirement account, those ones that we talked about being exempt as an asset, they are a stream of income. Any rental income, if you have that second home or if you have a two-family home, rental and any rentals coming in, that is income. Any investment income, interest and dividends. If you have created a trust to protect any of your assets, and that trust entitles you to income during your lifetime, then any income generated from that trust is seen to be your income for Medicaid eligibility purposes, and any annuity payments for an annuitized annuity. So those are some examples of the types of income that we most commonly see. Now, when I talked about the required minimum distribution, the actual amount that has to be taken from your retirement account in order for it not to be deemed as an asset for Medicaid eligibility and to be seen as income instead, depends on the county that you're living in. So for those of you who are listening who are clients from our Manhattan office or any of the five boroughs, New York City HRA only requires that clients take the required minimum distribution as is determined by the IRS each year. So it does not change the amount that you need to take from that IRA. Now, if you are out on Long Island, for example, Suffolk and Nassau counties have a chart that they use that, that the Department of Health has created, but New York City HRA has chosen not to use, that is an accelerated life expectancy table. So what that means is if the IRS table is saying how much you need to take out of that account every year as your required minimum distribution based on your age and their expectation of how long you're going to live, Medicaid does the same thing in these other counties, but it does so at an accelerated rate. So it puts your life expectancy as shorter, saying you're going to die sooner, meaning you have to take larger amounts out of that account. So the important thing to know is that if you were in a county outside of the five boroughs of New York City, it's likely that you're going to have to take more than the IRS requires you to uh, out of your retirement accounts as you are on Medicaid. When we add up all those pieces of income, social security, all of those things I named, if your total assets are, say, for example, $3,000, 
they will take, or I'm sorry, your total income is $3,000. They will subtract all of those, uh, the $895 that I said you're allowed to keep. So we have 3,000 as all of your income. We subtract $895. We also subtract any health insurance premiums that you're paying out of pocket. So uh, for example, the lowest rate that you can pay for your Medicare Part B is $144.60, although it is higher for those with higher income. That will be subtracted as well from your income in determining what your excess is. Anything you're paying for your Part D or if you have a Medicare Advantage plan or if you have a Medicare supplement with AARP, United Health, Aetna, any of these plans that provide, if you're paying out of pocket as opposed to if say your pension covers the cost of your supplement, that will be deducted. So now again, we've got $3,000 we take 895 off of that as the allowable amount. Then we subtract any health insurance premiums. And the number that we result in is what Medicaid refers to as your excess or surplus income. Now your excess or surplus income, you can either give it over to Medicaid and hand it over to the surplus unit every month, or you can take your excess income in the home care Medicaid setting and put it into what's called a pooled income trust. That is a way that you can shift the money into that trust every month as your income comes in and use it for the purpose of paying your bills, your rent, your mortgage, your utilities, your taxes, whatever it is that you need paid for. We are going to be doing a program specifically on pool trusts and how they work next Tuesday at two o'clock. So tune in for that for more information on the pooled income trust. So I wanna explain how this is gonna work logistically. So let's say you have your local bank around the corner um, and you every month your social security, your pension is deposited into that bank account. Let's say with Apple Bank. So every month those direct deposits go into Apple Bank and we will have predetermined and Medicaid will have predetermined what your excess is. So every month after that money goes into your bank account, what is determined to be your excess will go out of your bank account and it will go to the pooled income trust and then can be spent on your bills. But whatever is, is stays in your bank account, that 895 plus the cost of the health insurance premium, that can be spent in any way. So you'll have 895 in your Apple bank account which will be added to whatever you had, which had you remember, you were allowed to have a bank balance of $15,750. The $895 can be spent and the insurance premiums will be paid also out of that Apple bank account. So that is how income works if you're at home. The idea being that you may have income that are above the Medicaid allowable limits, but that doesn't mean that you don't still need it to live on to keep you at home to pay those regular expenses because not many of us can live on $895 a month of income that doesn't cover regular rent or utilities for most people. One thing I want to add, and there's still definitely going to be more information to come on this, is that in the budget, which was just passed, uh, just about two weeks ago in New York State, there is the addition of a 30 month, two and a half year look back for community home care Medicaid. A lot of the details of how this is actually going to work and what's going to happen with this are going to uh, be determined in the future and we're really parsing through the statutes to see how it's going to shake out. But as the law currently reads, for anybody who applies for Medicaid after October 1st of 2020, will be subject to a 30 month look back. So similar to the look back for the nursing home, they will say for the past 30 months prior to, to applying for care, what assets did you give away during that time? And for any assets that were given away by you, those will have a penalty period, which will be a period of time for which you are not eligible for care through the Medicaid program. 
Again, this is a very new development. Uh, we, we have not seen this even proposed in the past through all, all the legislative work that I've done. Um, and so what we're trying to do is really parse through the statute and figure out what the practical implications are going to be. And so we will certainly be writing more and speaking more about this as things unfold. But that's an important thing to know. And the most important takeaway that I have from the change in the law is that now more than ever, it's important to plan earlier than it was before, because we used to think that you could transfer assets into a trust or to your family members right before needing home care Medicaid, and that's not the case anymore. So it's an important thing to, to look at. Um, I don't think that there are currently any questions, but I just want to check, uh, just and see, are there currently any questions waiting? No, there are no questions on our end. Okay, great. So that is the a very uh, quick version of some of the things that come up a lot in terms of community Medicaid. Um, one of the things that, that Robin's going to go into on, on Thursday is the nursing home situation. Um, the one thing I will point out, because it'll be important if you're tuning in also next Tuesday, is that that pooled trust to protect the excess income does not apply in the case of those individuals who are receiving uh, nursing home or chronic Medicaid, institutional Medicaid. I think we have a question. We do. Is a pool trust the same as an irrevocable trust? That's a good question. So a pool trust is actually under the federal law, a type of supplemental needs trust. So a pool trust is specifically a trust for the benefit of a disabled individual who uh, is looking to protect government benefits and the assets in that trust can be used for the benefit of that individual, as opposed to an irrevocable trust, which we spoke about last week, which is a, there are many types of irrevocable trusts, but the irrevocable trust that's most often talked about in the context of Medicaid planning is one in which the assets in the trust cannot be used for the individual. So the pooled trust is a different animal that is, again, for the benefit of a disabled person. Britt, we have another question. Okay. Home care Medicaid, Medicare just about eight months ago, I know someone who applied and they looked back 30 days. I guess this changed. I think they mean home care Medicaid. Yes, I can explain that. But this is an interesting thing. So when I first started practicing, um, you know, I read the statute and what it actually says is that you need to be eligible for Medicaid on the first day of the month in which you're seeking services. So if I'm looking for April eligibility for home care, then I need to be eligible. My assets need to be under that $15,750 when really on the close of business on the day the prior month closed. So often people think of it as a 30 day look back because you're providing a bank statement from that prior month because it's the only thing that's available when applying at the beginning of a month. However, if that bank statement showed right now with no look back, if it showed that on the last day of the month, I transferred $20,000 out of my name so that I could be eligible on the first day of the following month, I would still be eligible on the first day of the following month. So again, while you're providing that bank statement, it's not a look back in the same way in that there is no penalty assessed if there was a transfer done within that prior 30 days. Britt, I have a question. When do you apply for Medicaid? Sure, so this type of Medicaid is, is a Medicaid that you apply for when you have long-term care costs that you're looking to be covered by the program. So we're talking about a home health aid in this circumstance where we're talking about community Medicaid or the, to cover the cost of a nursing home if we're talking about chronic or institutional Medicaid. Now, when each individual person should apply is really going to depend on a lot of different factors that you should really have looked at by your attorney. So you should look at you know, what assets are in your name, what level of care do you need, for how long do you 
anticipate or expect you're going to need that care? Do you think you're going to run out of money? Also, what level of your assets are you looking to protect to pass on to your beneficiaries? There are some clients that I have who are very happy to spend every dime that they have on the cost of their care. Um, and they do so and they don't apply for services until they've run out. Then I have another client who might, who recently I was dealing with someone who has a disabled child. So it's very important to them that some of their assets are protected for that child who can't provide for themselves. So when they're gone, there are assets in a trust for that child. So everybody's situation and when to apply is going to be very different. Next question is, does long-term care insurance premium count toward monthly health expenses? So the premium for the long-term care insurance is going to be uh, a premium that you will pay out of your account. So that won't be money that goes into the pooled income trust. Dealing with long-term care insurance and Medicaid is very complicated because as I said at the beginning, Medicaid is the payer of last resort. So if you have long-term care insurance, you must use and access that long-term care insurance before Medicaid can pick up. Um, I have had people who have needed both their long-term care insurance and their, and their Medicaid in place because they have, they have uh, had needs that exceeded the cost of their long-term care. But the long-term care does have to pay out as much as it will according to the policy first before Medicaid will pay for anything. Britt, just to be clear, if we need to set up community Medicaid for home care, it needs to be applied for before October in order to avoid this new 30 month look back? Well, um, if you have transferred assets in the prior two and a half years to the October 1st date, then yes, I would recommend applying if you need the care, applying before that time. Um, one of the things that's very unclear in the law is whether or not that 30 month look back will be assessed post eligibility, which when we say post eligibility, what we mean is that every year you have a recertification. So the question is, if you apply now in April and uh, you have to recertify a year from now, when they recertify you, will they be imposing that 30 month look back at that time? Will they look and see, did you transfer two and a half years back from that time? And that's something that we don't know right now and we're looking into and we're looking for some clarification. Um, that being said, you know, that could, that's also a year of care that somebody received that they might not have otherwise. So again, this is gonna be very case by case to determine what the best thing is. It also depends how much you transfer during that time and what your penalty might be. Um, and all of that will have to be um, evaluated on an individual basis. What if you were able to transfer uh, in the two and a half years before to a spouse? Good question. So transfers to a spouse are an exempt transfer. So if I have $100,000 and I transfer it to my spouse, that will not create a penalty period in the current situation for community Medicaid where there are no penalties, in the future when there's a 30 month look back, or in an institutional Medicaid situation where there's a five year look back, because it was a transfer to a spouse, it's an exempt transfer and that's not an issue. And there are certain other exempt transfers to disabled children and, and uh, various other um, exceptions to the rule. When do you think we'll get an answer on the recertification question? <laughs> you know, that's very hard to say. Um, you know, we, we have a very active bar association who's currently putting together a lot of information to seek clarification from those in Albany who are handling this, the Department of Health, the legislature, um, those people at the governor's office that work on things like this. So hopefully we'll have an answer sooner. I mean, the, the bleakest uh, outlook would be if we get an answer the first time we try to recertify after October 1st, but I, I hope that we can clarify some of these issues before that time. I have another couple of questions here. If someone has a long-term care policy with limited time coverage, would it be wise to start a pooled trust two and a half years before the end of their long-term care policy expires? 
So that's a really complicated question, which I'm not sure if I have an answer to, but one clarification I want to make is that the pooled income trust is only something that you do at the time that you are applying for Medicaid. So a pool trust is not something we do for advanced planning for estate planning purposes. So it is just where we put the excess income in the months that you're on Medicaid so that Medicaid sees that you're meeting this spend down requirement. So pool trust is not gonna be an advanced um, issue to look at. But one of the things that we are looking at with the new law is how transfers to the pool trust will be looked at by the state in terms of transfers. And, and that is still something that, that we're taking a look at. Um, but, but it is important to realize that that pool trust is actually done at the time that you're applying for Medicaid. There's no benefit to doing it in advance. Here's a great question. Would Medicaid cover the cost of a 24-7 aid if you're living in an assisted living facility? So the answer is yes, but maybe not. So yes, in theory, it can because Medicaid is set to cover what your, what your needs are. So if there is proof given that there is a need for 24-hour care, no matter where you live, then that is what they are supposed to provide. Now, however, what we find is that certain factors reduce someone's likelihood of receiving that award of 24-7 care. Being in an assisted living where there are other supports available is an example of that. So if you have other other you know, an assisted living usually has some level of home health aid assistance, some, some level of meal preparation. And if that is provided, Medicaid is not gonna double pay for those services. They're not gonna put services on top of services. So if you can prove that you have needs that go, that are 24 seven needs that go beyond, then yes. Um, another example of, of a time that we often find it's hard to receive that 24 seven care far for those individuals that are living with another adult that when the nurse comes from the agency to determine how many hours of care, they think that that other adult living in the home can provide some amount of care. And so a lot of that goes into the advocacy. And I know, I know we did a webinar about advocacy at the Medicaid assessment level last week. Um, that's really when that advocacy comes in. Um, and we're, when we have to really show the reasons why this person needs the level of care that we're requesting. Great. I have, looks like one last question here. The $15,750 is what you are allowed to have as an asset when applying for Medicaid. Correct. So, when you add up the balance of all of the assets that you have, it has to be less than $15,750. Now, in addition to the $15,750, you could have a prepaid irrevocable burial. So before you go on Medicaid or, or when you're on Medicaid, you can pay towards your funeral. And if it's an irrevocable pre-plan, and that's a specific type of pre-plan for Medicaid purposes, that your funeral home should know about, then if you have a $15,000 account being held by preplan for your funeral, then you can have that $15,000 account in addition to your $15,750 of resources. Another question popped up. Who determines what level of care is appropriate for a home care recipient? So after the financial eligibility is determined, then there are nursing assessments. So there's an RN that actually does an assessment. Now, in most cases, our clients are going on to manage long-term care Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid in New York State is outsourced out to companies similar to, a, um, you could think of it like an insurance company. The state pays that company and the company provides all the services you need. So if you need supplies in the home, then that's covered by the company. If you need um, adult daycare services that are Medicaid funded, that gets provided by the same company. And they basically pay for it. They would pay also the home care agency that would send care into your house. When you're at the point where you've been deemed financially eligible, you will make an appointment with one of these plans 
who sends an RN into your home. And, and right now we're doing a lot of this by video conferencing and telephonically with the current situation. And they have what's called a UAS, Uniform Assessment, uh, I forget what the S stands for, UAS tool. And this is the tool that will determine how many hours of care you need, which is based on what activities of daily living you need assistance with. So they don't see monitoring someone or as they call it babysitting as hours that need care. However, they will see needing assistance to get to the toilet, assistance walking, eating, preparing food. All of these are things that somebody needs assistance with all the way up to somebody who, you know, if they're bed bound and they cannot turn themselves and they need to be turned every two hours. And as the cares get greater and greater and those tasks get greater and greater, more hours are awarded. Another change that we're going to see um, with the new law, and again, I promise we will be providing more information on the new laws, is that they're changing the assessment tool and the state has decided to take over these assessments from the individual plans. However, this has a longer rollout. Um, I think it's April of 2021 that the new assessment tool has to be created by. It's not even in existence yet. And this is going to change it and make it more like traditional long-term care insurance, where you're going to need assistance with three activities of daily living in order to receive the services. And uh, there is also an exception from that, that if you have a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's, you will only need to show that you need assistance with one activity of daily living. And these are all things, again, that just came out in the last two weeks with the new budget. The next question is, how does Medicaid look at an adult child in the home with regard to her assets and income? So an adult child in the home, their assets and income are not looked at for Medicaid eligibility purposes for the parent. Um, this is because the only persons who are legally responsible relatives of another under the law are a spouse or the parent of a minor child. So if there's a minor child who needs to apply for services, their parents' income and assets are looked at. But there is no other legally responsible relative under the law. The last question I have up here right now is, what is allowed to be paid by the pooled trust once you have been accepted for Medicaid? So the, uh, this is going to be something I'm going to go very in depth on on Tuesday, but in general, it's anything for the benefit of the Medicaid recipient who is the beneficiary of that trust. So it is, uh, it can't pay anything that, that Medicaid is supposed to pay for because Medicaid is a government benefit you're looking to protect it for. So if you have an aid coming in four hours a day, it can't pay the aid extra for those four hours. However, if Medicaid only approves you for four hours, it can pay for another two hours a day so that you have an aid longer. It can pay for food, clothing, assuming Medicaid is the only government benefit that you're on. It can pay your rent, your mortgage, your utilities, your credit card bills, not past bills, but current bills. Um, it can pay if you're gonna take the train to go visit your daughter for Christmas, it could pay your train ticket. So it, it can pay for a lot of things for the benefit of the Medicaid individual. Great. Oh, another one popped up. If okay. I choose to hire a private person for care until my money runs out and then I apply for Medicaid, will Medicaid consider the money I spent on care as a transfer of money and therefore uh, be a penalty? No. That is payment for goods and services. So you can use your money for yourself however you want to prior to applying for care. You could buy yourself a car, but it has to be for yourself. You could um, use that money any way you want as long as you didn't give it away for, for no compensation to another person or to a trust or another entity. So if you validly spent it down on things for yourself, then that is not going to create any kind of penalty for Medicaid purposes. Thank you, Brett. I have a... I want to just... Oh, sorry. I just was going to bring up one other issue. Okay. Um, is uh, We didn't talk about what happens with the spouse. 
So we were very concerned this year, knowing that there were going to be a lot of changes in the Medicaid budget. We were very concerned that our beloved spousal refusal was going to be lost um, in the Medicaid budget this year. And the good news is it was not lost. So New York State still has spousal refusal. And this is a great thing. It's really, it's really helpful to not impoverish the, the community spouse or the well spouse when their other spouse gets sick. But I want to explain what this means. And, and this, again, is one of those things that's going to be different for those of you who are listening from the five boroughs um, or, or, or other counties, as opposed to perhaps Suffolk County um, or Nassau County. So when a, an individual applies for Medicaid by statute, they are allowed to have $15,750. And their spouse can have assets as well. And if their spouse signs a spousal refusal, the assets and income of the spouse although looked at and you need to provide that information for a full Medicaid application, they're not deemed to be the Medicaid applicant's assets and income. However, um, if you have more than the spousal allowance amount that Medicaid says that you can have, that the state says that you can have, Medicaid has the right to come back and ask the spouse, again, as the only legally responsible relative to contribute to the cost of their spouse's care. Many attorneys are going to tell you differently how that how this should be handled and 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 what is done. There are some people who um, don't deal with it. Sometimes Medicaid will will file a lawsuit. Sometimes they will not. Um, in a lot of our cases, we negotiate with New York City because they do look for a contribution from the spouse and we negotiate the amount down to something the spouse can afford. Um, however, in the other counties, this is not something that is currently being looked after. I have been told that out in Suffolk County, for example, they started sending some letters about this um, and looking for contribution from the spouse, but that's a very new thing in Suffolk County. So it's really important when you're looking at transfer of assets, and we talked about being an exempt transfer to the spouse, that you really look at what assets both spouses have when applying and make sure that not just are you protecting the spouse who needs Medicaid, but you're also protecting the other spouse who wants to make sure that they don't become impoverished by the cost of their spouse's care. Heard a couple more questions. Does the trust okay. account, the pooled trust account run month to month and can it be carried over to the next month? Uh, every month your overage has to go into the trust. It is like a regular count in that anything unused at the end of the month is still there the next month. It does continue on for your lifetime, but immediately upon the death of the applicant recipient, the Medicaid person, the, uh, the pool trust beneficiary, immediately upon death, the assets are, are lost to the trust. So you don't get to pass those assets on. So that the best thing to do is to spend that pool trust money as fast as you can each month. Right. If the pool trust pays for medical expenses, can the individual still deduct it on their tax return? Uh, the pool trust doesn't pay for medical expenses because your health insurance is going to cover those expenses. So you don't usually have the pool trust paying. As for the if they were to pay something like that, I would have to say that's a, a question for your accountant. Question, isn't the well spouse able to keep a certain amount of resources under spousal refusal? Yes, so, so the well spouse, the, the high end of that limit is $128,640, and that is the 2020 number. And anything above that, then Medicaid can say that the spouse is above the limit and will seek contribution. If you're underneath that amount, then, then they are not going to seek contribution from the spouse. And the income that the spouse is allowed to keep um, is uh, it's around $3,200 a month. And anything above that, again, actually there's a, there's a, a calculation. So it's, if we say 3,200 a month, although I know my number is a little off, um, and you have four, the spouse has 4,000 a month in income, they are $800 over. Medicaid can ask them for one quarter of the overage, so that would be 
one quarter of the 800, so it would be for $200 Medicaid could ask the spouse to contribute. And again, that's usually in New York City, that's a negotiable number. There's another question uh, from somebody else. Okay. Can the pool trust pay toward a bathroom remodel to make it handicap accessible? Yes, but a big expense like that is something that I, I would recommend that you contact the pool trust in advance and ask them what they want you to submit as proof of that remodel to make sure that that bill gets paid. Sometimes they want you to get two estimates or they each have their, each pool trust has their own rules. And, and again, I'll, I'll talk more in depth about that on Tuesday. I don't see any more questions, Britt. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, I hope this was informative. I know, especially with the new laws, there's a lot of questions out there. And so we're hoping that, um, I, I don't want to be giving too much information before we've really worked out the kinks of how the system's going to work, um, but we are providing information in our newsletters and anything uh, that we write or these webinars also go up on our website. So take a look at that and we're, we're going to keep providing you with as much information as we can as things unfold. Thank you everyone. Stay home, stay healthy.